lives of the eminent grammarians part one of the lives of the twelve caesars by gaius suetonius tranquillus this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by Lini. the lives of the twelve caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Lives of the Eminent Grammarians, Part One. The science of grammar was, in ancient times, far from being in vogue at Rome. Indeed, it was of little use in a rude state of society, when the people were engaged in constant wars and had not much time to bestow on the cultivation of the liberal arts. At the outset, its pretensions were very slender, for the earliest men of learning, who were both poets and orators, may be considered as half Greek. I speak of Livius and Aeneas, who are acknowledged to have taught both languages as well at Rome as in foreign parts. But they only translated from the Greek, and if they composed anything of their own in Latin, it was only from what they had before read. For although there are those who say that this Aeneas published two books, one on letters and syllables, and the other on meters, Lucius Cotta has satisfactorily proved that they are not the works of the poet Aeneas, but of another writer of the same name, to whom also the treatise on the rules of augury is attributed crates of malus then was in our opinion the first who introduced the study of grammar at rome he was contemporary with aristarchus and having been sent by king attalus as envoy to the senate in the interval between the second and third punic wars soon after the death of aeneas he had the misfortune to fall into an open sewer in the palatine quarter of the city and broke his leg. After which, during the whole period of his embassy and convalescence, he gave frequent lectures, taking much pains to instruct his hearers, and he has left us an example well worthy of imitation. It was so far followed that poems hitherto little known the works either of deceased friends of, or other approved writers were brought to light, and, being read and commented on, were explained to others. Thus Caius Octavius Lampadio edited the Punic War of Nevius, which, having been written in one volume without any break in the manuscript, had divided into seven books. After that, Quintus Varganteius undertook the annals of Aeneas, which he read on certain fixed days to crowded audiences. So Lelius Archelaus and Vectius Philocomus read and commented on the satires of their friend Lucilius, which Linnaeus Pompeius, a freedman, tells us he studied under Archelaus, and Valerius Cato under Philocomus. Two others also taught and promoted grammar in various branches, namely, Lucius Elius Lanovinus, the son-in-law of Quintus Elius, and Servius Claudius, both of whom were Roman knights, and men who rendered great services both to learning and the Republic. Lucius Elius had a double cognomen, for he was called Precanius, because his father was a herald, Stilo, because he was in the habit of composing orations for most of the speakers of highest rank. Indeed, he was so strong a partisan of the nobles that he accompanied Quintus Metellus Numidicus in his exile. Servius, having clandestinely obtained his father-in-law's book before it was published, was disowned for the fraud, which he took so much the heart that, overwhelmed with shame and distress, he retired from Rome and being seized with a fit of the gout, in his impatience he applied a poisonous ointment to his feet, which half killed him, so that his lower limbs mortified while he was still alive. After this, 
more attention was paid to the science of letters, and it grew in public estimation, insomuch that men of the highest rank did not hesitate in undertaking to write something on the subject. And it is related that sometimes there were no less than twenty celebrated scholars in Rome. So high was the value, and so great were the rewards of grammarians, that Latatius Daphnidus, jocularly called Pan's Herd, by Linnaeus Melissus, was purchased by Quintus Catullus for two hundred thousand sesterces, and shortly afterwards made a freedman. And that Lysias Apuleius, who was taken into the pay of Apicius Calvinus, a wealthy Roman knight, at the annual salary of ten thousand crowns, had many scholars. Grammar also penetrated into the provinces, and some of the most eminent amongst the learned taught it in foreign parts, particularly in Gallia Togata. In the number of these we may reckon Octavius Teucer, Sisenius Jacus, and Oppius Carus, who persisted in teaching to a most advanced period of his life, at a time when he was not only unable to walk, but his sight failed. The appellation of grammarian was borrowed from the Greeks, but at first the Latins called such persons literati. Cornelius Nepus, also in his book, where he draws a distinction between a literate and a philologist, says that in common phrase those are properly called literati, who are skilled in speaking or writing with care or accuracy, and those more specially deserve the name who translated the poets and were called grammarians by the Greeks. It appears that they were named literators by Masala Corvinus in one of his letters, when he says that it does not refer to Furius Bibacolus, not even to Sigida, nor to Cato the literator, meaning, doubtless, that Valerius Cato was both a poet and an eminent grammarian. Some there are who draw a distinction between a literati and a literator, as the Greeks do between a grammarian and a grammatist applying the former term to men of real erudition, the latter to those whose pretensions to learning are moderate. And this opinion Orbilius supports by examples. For he says that in old times, when a company of slaves was offered for sale by any person, it was not customary, without good reason, to describe either of them in the catalogue as a literati, but only as a literator, meaning that he was not a proficient in letters, but had a smattering of knowledge. The early grammarians taught rhetoric also, and we have many of their treatises which include both sciences. Whence it arose, I think, that in later times, although the two professions had then become distinct, the old custom was retained, or the grammarians introduced into their teaching some of the elements required for public speaking, such as the problem, the periphrasis, the choice of words, description of character, and the like in order that they might not transfer their pupils to the rhetoricians no better than ill-taught boys. But I perceive that these lessons are now given up in some cases, on account of the want of application, or the tender years of the scholar, for I do not believe that it arises from any dislike in the master. I recollect that when I was a boy it was the custom of one of these, whose name was Princeps, to take alternate days for declaiming and disputing, and sometimes he would lecture in the morning and declaim in the afternoon, when he had his pulpit removed. I heard also that even within the memories of our own fathers, some of the pupils of the grammarians passed directly from the schools to the courts, and at once took a high place in the ranks of the most distinguished advocates. The professors at that time were, indeed, men of great eminence, of some of whom I may be able to give an account in the following chapters. Savius Nicanor first acquired fame and reputation by his teaching, and besides he made commentaries, the greater part of which, however, are said to have been borrowed. He also wrote a satire, in which he informs us that he was a freedman, and had a double cognomen, in the following verses. Saevius Nicanor marci libertus negabit, Saevius postumius idem, 
said Marcus, do quebit. What Savius Nicanor, the freedman of Marcus, will deny, the same Savius, called also Posthumius Marcus, will assert. It is reported that, in consequence of some infamy attached to his character, he retired to Sardinia, and there ended his days. Aurelius Apilius, the freedman of some Epicurean, first taught philosophy, then rhetoric, and less of all, grammar. Having closed his school, he followed Rutilius Rufus, when he was banished to Asia, and there the two friends grew old together. He also wrote several volumes on a variety of learned topics, nine books of which he distinguished by the number and names of the nine muses. As he says, not without reason, they being the patrons of authors and poets. I observe that its title is given in several indexes by a single letter, but he uses two in the heading of a book called Pinnax. Marcus Antonius Nepho, free-born native of Gaul, was exposed in his infancy, and afterwards received his freedom from his foster father, and, as some say, was educated at Alexandria, where Dionysius Scytobrachion was his fellow pupil. This, however, I am not very ready to believe, as the times at which they flourished scarcely agree. He is said to have been a man of great genius, of singular memory, well read in Greek as well as Latin, and of a most obliging and agreeable temper, who never haggled about remuneration, but generally left it to the liberality of his scholars. He first taught in the house of Julius Caesar, when the latter was yet but a boy, and afterwards in his own private house. He gave instruction in rhetoric also, teaching the rules of eloquence every day, but declaiming only on festivals. It is said that some very celebrated men frequented his school, and, among others, Marcus Cicero, during the time he held the praetorship. He wrote a number of works, although he did not live beyond his fiftieth year. But Ateus, the philologist, says that he left only two volumes, De Latino Sermone, and that the other works ascribed to him were composed by his disciples, and were not his, although his name is sometimes to be found in them. Marcus Pompilius Andronicus, a native of Syria, while he professed to be a grammarian, was considered an idol follower of the Epicurean sect, and little qualified to be a master of a school. Finding, therefore, that at Rome, not only Antonius Nepho, but even other teachers of less note were preferred to him, he retired to Cume, where he lived at his ease. And, though he wrote several books, he was so needy and reduced to such straits as to be compelled to sell that excellent little work of his, the Index to the Annals, for sixteen thousand sesterces. Orbilius had informed us that he redeemed this work from the oblivion into which it had fallen, and took care to have it published with the author's name. Orbilius Papillus of Beneventum, being left an orphan by the death of his parents, who both fell a sacrifice to the plots of their enemies on the same day, acted at first as a parator to the magistrates. He then joined the troops in Macedonia, when he was first decorated with the plumed helmet, and afterwards promoted to serve on horseback. Having completed his military service, he resumed his studies, which he had pursued with no small diligence from his youth upwards. And, having been a professor for a long period in his own country, at last, during the consulship of Cicero, made his way to Rome, where he taught with more reputation than profit. For, in one of his works, he says that he was then very old and lived in a garret. He also published a book with the title of Periologus, containing complaints of the injurious treatment to which professors submitted, without seeking redress at the hands of parents. His sour temper betrayed itself, not only in his disputes with the sophists opposed to him, whom he lashed on every occasion, but also towards his scholars, as Horace tells us who calls him a flogger, and the Mishis Marsus, who says of him, Si quos orbilius ferulas cuticaque cecidit, 
if those orbilius with rod or ferule thrashed and not even men of rank escaped his sarcasms for before he became noticed happening to be examined as a witness in a crowded court varro the advocate on the other side put the question to him what he did and by what profession he gained his livelihood he replied that he lived by removing hunchbacks from the sunshine into the shade alluding to morena's deformity he lived till he was near a hundred years old but he had long lost his memory as the verse of bibaculus informs us orbilius ubinam est literarum oblivio where is orbilius now that rack of learning lost his statue is shown in the capital at beneventum it stands on the left hand and is sculptured in marble representing him in a sitting posture wearing the pallium with two writing cases in his hand he left a son named also orbilius who like his father was a professor of grammar Ateus, the philologist of freedmen was born at athens of him capito Ateus, the well-known jurisconsul says that he was a rhetorician among the grammarians and a grammarian among the rhetoricians Asinius Pollio, in the book in which he finds fault with the writings of Sallus for his great affectation of obsolete words, speaks thus. In this work, his chief assistant was a certain Ateus, a man of rank, a splendid Latin grammarian, the aider and preceptor of those who studied the practice of declamation. In short, one who claimed from himself the cognomen of Philologus. Writing to Lysias Hermas, he says, that he had made great proficiency in Greek literature and some in Latin, that he had been a hearer of Antonius Nepho and his Hermas, and afterwards began to teach others. Moreover, that he had for pupils many illustrious youths, among whom were the two brothers Appius and Pulcher Claudius, and that he even accompanied them to their province. He appears to have assumed the name of Philologus, because, like Eratosthenes, who first adopted that cognomen, he was in high repute for his rich and varied stores of learning, which indeed it was evident from his commentaries, though but few of them are extant. Another letter, however, to the same Hermas, shows that they were very numerous. Remember, it says, to recommend generally our extracts, which we have collected, as you know, of all kinds, into eight hundred books. He afterwards formed an intimate acquaintance with Caius Celestius, and on his death with Azinius Pollio. And when they undertook to write a history, he supplied the one with short annals of all Roman affairs, from which he could select at pleasure, and the other with rules on the art of composition. I am, therefore, surprised that Azinius Pollio should have supposed that he was in the habit of collecting old words and figures of speech for Celeste when he must have known that his own advice was that none but well-known and common and appropriate expressions should be made use of, and that, above all things, the obscurity of the style of Sallust and his bold freedom in translations should be avoided. End of Lives of the Eminent Grammarians, Part 1 Recording by Lenny, Rio de Janeiro, 2008《Lives of the Eminent Grammarians, Part Two, of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forster. Lives of Eminent Grammarians, Part Two. Valerio Scato was, as some have informed us, the freedman of one Bersanus, a native of Gaul. He himself tells us in his little work called Indignatio that he was born free, and being left an orphan, was exposed to be easily stripped of his patrimony during the license of Silla's administrations. 
he had a great number of distinguished pupils and was highly esteemed as a preceptor suited to those who had a poetical turn as appears from these short lines cato grammaticus latina siren qui solus legit ac facit poetas cato the latin siren grammar taught and verse to form the poet skilled and poetry rehearse besides his treatise on grammar he composed some poems of which his lydia and diana are most admired tessida mentions his lydia lydia doctorum maxima cura liber lydia a work to men of learning dear sina thus notices the diana secula permaneat nostri diana catonis immortal be our cato song of diana he lived to extreme old age but in the lowest state of penury and almost in actual want having retired to a small cottage when he gave up his tusculan villa to his creditors as bibacalus tells us si quis forte mei domum catonis de pictas minio asulas et illos custodis vidit hortulos priapi miratur vibus ille disciplinis tantam sit sapientiam assecutus quam tres cauliculi et celebra faris racemi duo tegula sub una ad summam propri nutriant senectam if perchance any one has seen the house of my cato with marble slabs of the richest hues and his gardens worthy of having priapus for their guardian he may well wonder by what philosophy he has gained so much wisdom that a daily allowance of three coverts half a pound of meal and two bunches of grapes under a narrow roof should serve for his subsistence to extreme old age and he says in another place catonis modo gale tusculanum tota creditor urbe venditabat mirati sumus unicum magistrum sumum grammaticum optimum poetam omnes solvere posse quaestionis unum difficile expedire nomen en cort zeno doti en iecur cratetis we lately saw my gallus cato's tusculan villa exposed to public sale by his creditors and wondered that such an unrivalled master of the schools most eminent grammarian and accomplished poet could solve all propositions and yet found one question too difficult for him to settle how to pay his debts we find in him the genius of xenodotus the wisdom of crates cornelius epicadius a freedman of lysias cornelius Scylla, the dictator was his apparitor in the augural priesthood and much beloved by his son faustus so that he was proud to call himself the freedman of both he completed the last book of Scylla's commentaries which his patron had left unfinished laberius hiera was bought by his master out of a slave dealer's cage and obtained his freedom on account of his devotion to learning it is reported that his disinterestedness was such that he gave gratuitous instruction to the children of those who were prescribed in the time of Scylla. courteous nicia was the intimate friend of gnaeus pompeius and caius memmius but having carried notes from memmius to pompey's wife when she was debauched by memmius pompey was indignant and forbade him his house he was also on familiar terms with marcus cicero who thus speaks of him in his epistle to dolabella i have more need of receiving letters from you than you have of desiring them from me for there is nothing going on at rome in which i think you would take any interest except perhaps that you may like to know that i am appointed umpire between our friends nicias and vidius the one it appears alleges in two short verses that nicias owes him money the other like an aristarchus cavils at them i like an old critic 
am to decide whether they are nicias or spurious again in a letter to atticus he says as to what you write about nicias nothing could give me greater pleasure than to have him with me if i was in a position to enjoy his society but my province is to me a place of retirement and solitude Sica easily reconciled himself to this state of things, and therefore I would prefer having him. Besides, you are well aware of the feebleness, and the nice and luxurious habits of our friend Nicias. Why should I be the means of making him uncomfortable, when he can afford me no pleasure? At the same time, I value his goodwill. Leneus was a freedman of Pompey the Great and attended him in most of his expeditions. On the death of his patron and his sons, he supported himself by teaching in a school which he opened near the temple of Tellus in the Carium, in the quarter of the city where the house of the Pompey stood. Such was his regard for his patron's memory that when Sallust described him as having a brazen face and a shameless mind, he lashed the historian in a most bitter satire, as a bull spizzle, a gormandizer, a braggart, and a tippler, a man whose life and writings were equally monstrous, besides charging him with being a most unskilful plagiarist who borrowed the language of Cato and other old writers. It is related that, in his youth, Having escaped from slavery by the contrivance of some of his friends, he took refuge in his own country, and that after he had applied himself to the liberal arts, he brought the price of his freedom to his former master, who, however, struck by his talents and learning, gave him manumission gratuitously. Quintus Sicilius, and a pirate by descent, but born at Tusculum, was a freedman of Atticus Satrius, a Roman knight, to whom Cicero addressed his epistles. He became the tutor of his patron's daughter, who was contracted to Marcus Agrippa, but, being suspected of an illicit intercourse with her, and sent away on that account, he betook himself to Cornelius Gallus, and lived with him on terms of the greatest intimacy which, indeed, was imputed to Gallus as one of his heaviest offences by Augustus. Then, after the condemnation and death of Gallus, he opened a school, but had few pupils, and those very young, nor any belonging to the higher orders, excepting the children of those he could not refuse to admit. He was the first, it is said, who held disputations in Latin, and who began to lecture on Virgil and the other modern poets, which the verse of the Mishis Marsus points out. Epirota tenelorum nutricula vatum. The epirate who, with tender care, our unfledged poets nursed. Various Flaccus, a freedman, distinguished himself by a new mode of teaching, for it was his practice to exercise the wits of his scholars by encouraging emulation among them not only proposing the subjects on which they were to write but offering rewards for those who were successful in the contest these consisted of some ancient handsome or rare book being in consequence selected by augustus as preceptor to his grandsons he transferred his entire school to the palatium but with the understanding that he should admit no fresh scholars the hall in catiline's house which had then been added to the palace, was assigned him for his school, with a yearly allowance of one hundred thousand sesterces. He died of old age, in the reign of Tiberius. There is a statue of him in Prineste, in the semicircle at the lower side of the forum, where he had set up calendars arranged by himself and inscribed on slabs of marble. Lucius Cursitius, a native of Tarentum, and in rank a freedman, had the cognomen of Pasidus, which he afterwards changed for Pansa. His first employment was connected with the stage, and his business was to assist the writers of farces. After that, he took to giving lessons in a gallery attached to a house, until his commentary on the Smyrna so brought him into notice 
that the following lines were written on him. Uni crasitio se crederis mirna probavit, desinite indocti coniugio hanc petere, soli crasitio se dixit nubere welle, intima cui soli nota sua extiterint. Crasitius only counts on Smyrna's love. Fruitless the wooings of the unlettered prove. Crasitius she receives with loving arms, for he alone unveiled her hidden charms. However, after having taught many scholars, some of whom were of high rank, and amongst others Julius Antonius, the triumvir's son, so that he might even be compared with various Flaccus, he suddenly closed his school, and joined the sect of Quintus Septimius the philosopher. Scribonius Aphrodisius, the slave and disciple of Urbilius, who was afterwards redeemed and presented with his freedom by Scribonia, the daughter of Libo, who had been the wife of Augustus, taught in the time of Varius. Whose books on orthography he also revised, not without some severe remarks on his pursuits and conduct. Gnaeus Julius Hyginus, a freedman of Augustus, was a native of Spain, although some say he was born at Alexandria, and that when that city was taken, Caesar brought him, then a boy, to Rome. He closely and carefully imitated Cornelius Alexander, a Greek grammarian, who, for his antiquarian knowledge, was called by many polyhistor, and by some history. He had the charge of the Palatine Library, but that did not prevent him from having many scholars, and he was one of the most intimate friends of the poet Ovid, and of Caius Licinius, the historian, a man of consular rank, who was related that Hyginus died very poor, and was supported by his liberality as long as he lived. Julius Modestus, who was a freedman of Hyginus, followed the footsteps of his patron in his studies and learning. Caius Melissus, a native of Spoletum, was freeborn, but having been exposed by his parents in consequence of quarrels between them, he received a good education from his foster father, by whose care and industry he was brought up, and was made a present of to Messenus as a grammarian. Finding himself valued and treated as a friend, he preferred to continue in his state of servitude, although he was claimed by his mother, choosing rather his present condition than that which his real origin entitled him to. In consequence, his freedom was speedily given him, and he even became a favorite with Augustus. By his appointment, he was made curator of the library in the portico of Octavia, and, as he himself informs us, undertook to compose, when he was a sexagenarian, his books of witticisms, which are now called the Book of Jests. Of these, he accomplished one hundred and fifty, to which he afterwards added several more. He also composed a new kind of story about those who were the toga, and called it Trabeat. Marcus Pomponius Marcellus, a very severe critic of the Latin tongue, who sometimes pleaded causes, in a certain address on the plaintiff's behalf, persisted in charging his adversary with making a solecism, until Cassius Severus appealed to the judges to grant an adjournment, until his client should produce another grammarian, as he was not prepared to enter into a controversy respecting a solecism, instead of defending his client's rights. On another occasion, when he had found fault with some expression in a speech made by Tiberius, Ateus Capito affirmed that if it was not Latin, at least it would be so in time to come. Capito is wrong, cried Marcellus. It is certainly in your power, Caesar, to confer the freedom of the city on whom you please, but you cannot make words for us. Asinius Gallus tells us that he was formerly a pugilist in the following epigram. We caput ad laivam decit glossemata nobis, praecipit, os nullum vel potius pugilis, who ducked his head to shun another's fist, though he expound old sauce, yet, well I wist, with pummeled nose and face, he is but a pugilist. Remius Palaemon of Vicentia, the offspring of a bondwoman, acquired the rudiments of learning, first as the companion of a weaver's, 
and then of his master's son at school. Being afterwards made free, he taught at Rome, where he stood highest in the rank of the grammarians. But he was so infamous for every sort of vice, that Tiberius and his successor Claudius publicly denounced him as an improper person to have the education of boys and young men entrusted to him. Still, his powers of narrative and agreeable style of speaking made him very popular. Besides which, he had the gift of making extempore verses. He also wrote a great many in various and uncommon meters. His insolence was such that he called Marcus Varro a hog, and bragged that letters were born and would perish with him, and that his name was not introduced inadvertently in the bucolics, as Virgil divined that Apollyon would some day be the judge of all poets and poems. He also boasted that having once fallen into the hands of robbers, they spared him, on account of the celebrity his name had acquired. He was so luxurious that he took the bath many times in a day, nor did his means suffice for his extravagance, although his school brought him in forty thousand sesterces yearly and he received not much less from his private estate, which he managed with great care. He also kept a broker's shop for the sale of old clothes, and it is well known that a vine he planted himself yielded three hundred and fifty bottles of wine. But the greatest of all his vices was his unbridled licentiousness in his commerce with women, which he carried to the utmost pitch of foul indecency. They tell a droll story of some one who met him in a crowd, and upon his offering to kiss him could not escape the salute. Master, said he, do you want to mouth every one you meet within a hurry? Marcus Valerius Prebus of Beritus, after long aspiring to the rank of centurion, being at last tired of waiting, devoted himself to study. He had met with some old authors at a bookseller's shop in the provinces, where the memory of ancient times still lingers, and is not quite forgotten as it is at Rome. Being anxious carefully to reproduce these, and afterwards to make acquaintance with other works of the same kind, he found himself an object of contempt, and was laughed at, for his lectures, instead of their gaining him fame or profit. Still, however, he persisted in his purpose, and employed himself in correcting, illustrating, and adding notes to many works which he had collected, his labors being confined to the province of a grammarian, and nothing more. He had, properly speaking, no scholars, but some few followers, for he never taught in such a way as to maintain the character of a master, but was in the habit of admitting one or two, perhaps at most three or four, disciples in the afternoon. And while he lay at ease and chatted freely on ordinary topics, he occasionally read some book to them, but that did not often happen. He published a few slight treatises on some subtle questions, besides which he left a large collection of observations on the language of the ancients. End of Lives of the Eminent Grammarians Recording by Lini in Rio de Janeiro, 2008